I was on a prayer walk last night, and as I was walking through the streets of our city that I love and I pray for and was asking for God to rend the heavens and come down, I was just, I was curious last night because I wanted, I wanted to sing something, a song just on prayer today. I, I don't talk to Ricardo or Kareem and say, hey, sing songs with, that start with the letter P or R or any of those things. I don't, we don't, we don't put those together. Um, so while I was on a prayer walk, I stopped on a park bench and I literally Googled songs of prayer. And this popular Christian website came up. And what was amazing to me is that it said the top 15 songs on prayer. And 12 or 13 of them were written 50 years ago. 50 years ago. Everything from leaning on the everlasting arms, sweet hour of prayer, tell it to Jesus, what a friend we have in Jesus, the Lord's prayer, um, take my life and let it be all these. And there was only two or three that they said are contemporary. And what's amazing is those songs that were, that were, were all sung today. <laughs> and we never, I, I need thee, that, that song, I need thee, the, the, the song, same God, the song that calls it, because songs about prayer are just not written anymore. There's just, there's not a song that just says, let's cry out to God, let's intercede. No one's writing a song that really becomes the key to an open heaven. I'm so thankful that the history of this place that David Wilkerson and Carter Conlon were men of prayer, men that are calling people to prayer, men that, 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 that spent time on their knees. But it's as if we're trying today to find some other way to bring heaven down. And folks, I'm telling you, heaven doesn't come down any way unless a church begins to pray. Isaiah cries, we want God to come down in verse one, but then Isaiah laments in verse seven and says, but we have no one that will stir up their hearts. That's what he does. He says, God, rend the heavens and come down. But then in verse 7, he goes, but who is it that, that's calling upon the name of the Lord? Who's stirring up their hearts? A rent heaven comes from a praying man. Don't miss this church. To get a nation back on their feet, we need a church to get on their knees again. That's what God is calling us to. The great, the great revi revival, the uh, historian of revival, J. Edwin Orr, said it like this. He says, history is silent about revivals that did not begin with prayer. That unless there is prayer, there is no awakening. And that's why what's dangerous today is we get, as I want to challenge you in just a few moments. I, and I want leaders to listen to me today that are watching around the world. A prayerless church will find substitutes and alternatives. A prayerless church will find alternatives and substitutes. See, when you lose prayer in the house, when you lose prayer amongst God's people, let me tell you the first thing. When you lose prayer, the first thing you lose is power. You lose the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says in Luke 24, 49, tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. He says that power of the Holy Spirit can only come with a church that finds itself comfortable in an upper room. When you lose prayer, people don't realize this, you lose praise in the house. Because it, listen, listen to what he says in Psalm 22, six, those who seek the Lord will what? Praise him not entertained, not looking at the music or the musicians, but if those that seek God will praise God, is what it says in Psalm 22. And when you lose prayer, you lose wisdom. Listen to James 1.5, if any of you lacks wisdom, we have to ask God. We have to be a church that has power, wisdom, and praise, and it all gets lost in prayerlessness. When you lose prayer, you become plagiarist. When you lose prayer, you need Google. When you lose prayer, you need podcasts to preach. But when you begin to get on your hands and knees before God, God, God will send wisdom and power. God will send praise and a sound of praise in the house that cannot be created by a choir of music or a preacher or a pastor. It is a sound that the heavens get opened up and it's a sound from heaven that all of a sudden you feel like you're joining with the chorus of heaven when you start to pray. Not praising with those on a microphone, but praising with myriads of angels that are before the throne of God. Something happens when God opens up the heavens. Something happens when the heavens are rent. When prayer is lost, I've noticed counseling goes up in the church 
because all of a sudden you need to, you need counselors instead of deliverance. See, praise needs props. Preachers become communicators, and anointing gives way to antics. And I'm just here to tell you, we need a church that prays. We need a people that pray. We need a people that says, "Oh God, rend the heavens and come down one more time and do something in our country and in our nation and in your country around the world." Jesus said in Matthew 21, 13, my house shall be called what? Not a house, of, not even a house of praise, not a house of worship, not a house even of preaching. It's a house of prayer. And we, we have, his house has become everything from, for, that is focused on everything but that. And that's why we must fight for prayer in the church. We must fight to pray F.B. Meyer, the great 19th century evangelist, said it like this. Don't miss this. He said this. He said, the greatest tragedy in life is not unanswered prayer, but it's unoffered prayer. It's when we don't even pray anymore. He says, it's not unanswered. It's when it's not even offered anymore. I was reading the story of the great professional golfer, Arnold Palmer, who was playing a series of exhibition matches in Saudi Arabia. And when he finished, the king of Saudi Arabia was so impressed with Arnold Palmer's expertise that he desired to give Arnold Palmer a gift. And uh, this Palmer, a multimillionaire in his own right from all of the, all of the masters that he's won and the, all, of the, uh, all the commercials that he did, he told the king, he said, it isn't really necessary. I enjoyed meeting your people and playing in your country, but I don't need a gift from the king. The king indicated his extreme displeasure not being able to give the golf pro a gift. In fact, Palmer was told by security, you need to accept the gift from a king. So Palmer wisely reconsidered and said, well, how about just giving me a golf club? That's it. Just a golf club as a wonderful memento here. Um, the story, the article said the king was so pleased that the following day, a messenger delivered to Palmer's hotel room a golf club. But it wasn't a golf club. It was the title to a golf club in the United States. It wasn't, it wasn't a club. It was like a club with buildings, 18 holes, trees. He, he delivered a, he, a whole golf, like country club is what the king gave to him. And I read this story, I go, what's the moral of the story? Every time I pray, I'm in the presence of the king. And, and let me just say this, and when you're in the presence of the king, ask big. Ask God to rend the heavens and come down and pour out his spirit one more time. Hallelujah. <laughs> Max Lucado said it like this, he says, the power of prayer is not in the one who prays, but it's in the one who hears it. It's the one that can take our feeble request and, and do great and mighty things. So if there is something that we have to begin to get better with, it is this letter P, prayer, because we are talking to the king. We're talking to the king of kings. And I wanna give you two passages as I take just a little bit of a deep dive that there's gonna be a charge and a challenge to us today. There's gonna be that hallelujah in the beginning, but then you're going to see the hurdle that can come that will try to block us from talking to the king. And so I want to give you two passages. I want to give you, I want us in, in a moment, we're going to go to Psalm 65, is the reason why we pray as we begin to recover prayer again in the church. And then I'm going to finish with 1 Kings chapter 20, which is the challenge to pray. The charge before the challenge. I want to tell you about what I call my favorite name for God in the Bible. I, I, listening to the choir sing, my God is awesome. What a phenomenal song. My deliverer, my healer, uh, and, and when you start, my provider. When I started to hear all those names that the choir was singing, I was so blessed. But as great as those names are, in Psalm 65, right in the midst of David praise and worship, something monumental about who God is and a name for God 
popped out to me. I'm going, that's my favorite name for God. He is a deliverer. I thank God for that. He is a healer. How many have experienced him as a healer? Uh, he, he is, as the song we've sung here, he is a chain breaker. How many have ever had chains broken in, in your life? I'm just telling you, I, I thank God. He is a savior. He is my salvation. He is my wisdom. But I'm telling you, right in the midst of David was praising God, I'm not sure David realized that in his praise, in his praise, he was going to say something revolutionary about prayer. It was almost as if David is throwing up a praise and someone next to him is going like, wow, that's awesome. Listen to what David says in Psalm 65, verse 1. He says, praise, and, I, and we're going to come back why it says this, praise awaits you. One version says, praise from us is waiting. It, there, there's this anticipation because we know there's going to be a shout. He says, praise awaits you, O God, in Zion. Here it comes. Here's my favorite name. You who answer prayer. I'm telling you, keep all the other names. To know he is the God that answers prayer. I, 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 my heart just leapt, leaped one of those words within me. It did. Who answers prayer? That's the adjectival phrase to, that, that begins to modify the word you. It's the second part that, that, that describes the you, the attribute it gives when it says you, you. And instead of just calling him God, he says, you who answers prayer. I'm, I'm just telling you, that's my new praise word. I just go, you who answers prayer gives me, come on, just throw one up right now. You who answer prayer, hallelujah. And that's why he says in the first part, he says, don't miss it. He says, our praise is in pause right now because our praise is waiting because we know, verse two, you who answer prayer, we don't even need a preacher. We don't need music. We don't need, because there's gonna be enough praise in us because you answer prayer. Because folks, and if you've never, if you've never prayed and have answered prayer, then I'm telling you, you're missing something in praise and worship. Something happens when you go, he healed me, he delivered me, he saved me, he guided me, he protected me on the F train. He's, he's good. I'm, that was a little personal. <laughs> you who answer prayer, hallelujah. This verse is so incredible and so important that I would do it a disservice not to move into even the practical in a few moments. That I kept thinking to myself, my problem is not God answering, but God's people not praying. The problem is not an an that God is not answering, but he, we're not praying. How sad it is to have a God that answers prayer, but a people that don't ask. To have a God that answers prayer, but a people that will find other things to do each day when we can call upon the king, make a request to the king. What a terrible indictment we have from the book of James 4.2 when James says, you have not because, which tells us that we're self-impoverished, impoverished of miracles, of blessings, of deliverance, of salvation, of revival. Isn't it amazing that prayer is our biggest struggle of our consistency in our Christian walk? I, I literally, we could stop, I can give an altar call for those that are having problems being consistent in their prayer life. 99% of you would stand up and say that. The other 1% would be lying. And so what you understand is it's always a fight for consistency. Why? Why is prayer a fight to be consistent with? It's because of this, you who answer prayer. That's what scares the enemy. Because we serve a God who answers prayer. I don't know about you, but when you have four kids, one of the things, there's two things you love. You love Costco. And you love rebates. You, you look for every way out. And so when you're buying appliances or anything for the household that has a, a high dollar value to it, you're going, okay, is it on sale? And is there a rebate? on this. 
That's why we, if you're buying something, you're going, okay, Best Buy is big on rebates. You buy something, you could pay three, $400 for that refrigerator or washer. Some of you are going like, what, what planet are you on that you can buy a refrigerator or a washer? But all of a sudden they'll go like, but if you buy it for this price, send this in and you get 150 or $200 back. Folks, they're not doing that because they're generous. They're doing that because you never send it in. Do you, know what, do you know why these companies, what they discovered? They discovered this. They said, if we give rebates and make people take the extra, they found out that only 18% of the people ever claim it. How many people cash in on the most wonderful name of God? You who answer prayer. You who answer prayer. I want to cash in on the God that answers prayer that begins that we can call upon him, that God is just a challenge for us today. See, Jesus does something in Matthew 6 on the Sermon on the Mount that doesn't occur anywhere else in the Bible. It's connected to prayer. It's It's this profound verse right in the midst, right in the center of the Sermon on the Mount. And this is what Jesus says. Jesus says this. It's a challenge to all of us today. Listen to what he says. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in secret, in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Which means, keep that verse up there for a moment. Which means prayer is never a waste of time. It's, it's, you will always, God will always reward those who will go in. Here's, but here's what's amazing. This, look, look at that verse again. But you, when you pray, go into your room, when you have shut your door, pray to your heavenly father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Ready for this church? Here's what's amazing. This is the only verse in the Bible that has the singular pronoun in it eight times. You, you, your, you, your, 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 you. He's saying the challenge is on you. Go back to the verse. Let me go go back to the verse again. But you, when you pray, go into your room. When you have shut your door, pray to your father who's in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. I think the challenge is for you. (laughs) Just a thought. Just a thought. I want the church to pray. I want people to pray. No, no, no. We want you to pray. We want you to begin to understand. Now, folks, we understand it's a challenge. The challenge to prayer is there. It's A.W. Tozer said it like this. He says, to desire revival or the open heaven and at the same time neglect prayer is to wish one way and walk another way. He said it just doesn't work like that. Now, folks, I get it. As a church... People look at the church outside the church and says, look at the church, it's a mess. And everything is a mess inside with all the stuff that's going on. And, and, and these are the outsiders that are saying that, that we're in a mess. Right? And I want to go, come on the inside, it's even worse. And that's okay. We're just, folks, we're just letting God rebuild and do something inside of us again. Folks, we're not perfect. We're, uh, uh, let me say it to you like this. My favorite tombstone, she had it already done, was done by Ruth Graham. She made, before Billy Graham died, his wife, Ruth Graham, passed away. But years before she passed away, she was driving one day, entered a construction zone with her car, and she reached the end, and the sign said this, end of construction, Thank you for your patience. He says, that's it. That's what I want on my tombstone. End of construction. Thank you for your patience. Which me, and it's there. You go to North Carolina, that's on Ruth Graham's, on, on, her, on her grave plot. And I'm just going to myself, I'm going, the moment you become a Christian, we put down yellow cones, yellow signs, because we're all under construction, trying to go, God, we want you, we need you. We need you to help us. Folks, let me just tell you, if you could see in the spirit, there's yellow cones all around this pulpit right now going, be patient with me. We're under construction. But there's coming a day we get to the end of construction and as we see him as he is, I thank God that all of a sudden the construction ends on that day. But for right now, we're under construction. 
That's why the great song, the writer, John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace, said it like this, I'm not what I ought to be, and I'm not what I even want to be, and I'm not even what I hope to be when I get to heaven, but thank God, I'm not what I used to be. How many can throw up their hands and say, I'm not what I used to be? Is there anybody else in here around the world or in this place that can say, if you see my life, I'm under construction right now? Anybody else that can raise your hand and just go, I'm under construction right now? Welcome to the team. Welcome to Times Square Church. There's cones everywhere. Now, since we know that he is the God that answers prayer, you who answer prayer, what is the challenge? We get this charge in Psalm 65, but what is the challenge? I was so moved by reading this that I said, oh God, please don't let this ever happen to my life. It's one of those construction cones. It was the evangelist, modern day, that God has used, Francis Chan, who said this. He said, our greatest fear should not be a failure, but of succeeding at things in life that really don't matter. Look at that for a second. Let that, let that seep in, in it, just for a moment. It's not a, my greatest fear is succeeding in things in life that really don't matter. To be an expert in literally the temporal, the things that don't translate into eternity. And that's why to understand this name, you who answer prayer, I'm going, God, that's what I want to be an expert at. That's what I want. I want to pray. God, there's so many construction cones around even my prayer life. There's so many construction cones around my life. But, oh, God, I thank you that though we're under construction, it's not like this is, it's not like when you're driving down. Do you ever drive down a a street that's been under construction like for years going, are they ever working on this thing? Anybody ever think that? None of us New Yorkers ever think that when we, when we see it. We never think that. But what's amazing to me, I can tell you this, God is always working on us. The Holy Spirit is always working on us. I want to give you a two, verse, two verses from the Old Testament, which is the hurdle. It occur, occurs in the middle of a larger story. And for some reason, the Holy Spirit, just as we had a little interruption of David's praise moment in Psalm 65, this giant story in the book of 1 Kings 20 almost just stood out to me that God goes, I'm gonna throw this in there because there's the, this is the danger of succeeding at things that really don't matter. It's just two verse story. It's in the middle of a battle of the Old Testament. Israel is in the middle of a war with the the Arameans. And while the king is passing by, the king of Israel is passing by, this two-verse dialogue is compelling. And this is what I want to finish with today. When I say the word finish, those that know me well, (laughs) doesn't mean anything. So I'm just letting you know. So if you're visiting with us, does this mean he's done? And the answer is no. So let me just read this to you now. Here's what it says. 1 Kings chapter 20. And as the king passed by, remember, this is just a a story that was just thrown in in the middle of a battle. As the king passed by, this man cried to the king and said, your servant went out into the midst of the battle and behold, a man turned aside and brought a man to me. And he said this, he says, guard this man. If for any reason he is missing, then your life shall be for his life or else you will pay a talent of silver. What he was saying was, Guard this guy. You're you're now going to be a jailer. This is a POW. He's a prisoner of war. Now look what this man says. And this is the part that brought conviction. And I want to just spend the final time here. And he said this, while your servant was busy here and there, he was gone. And the king of Israel said to him, so your judgment will be. You yourself had decided it. This is the part that got me, folks. While your servant was busy here and there, the main thing I was supposed to do, I lost it. Look at that. I was in charge of watching this prisoner. I was in charge. That was my duty. That was the thing. That was the thing I better succeed at because it was a matter of life and death. But while I was busy here and there, I neglected the stuff that I was supposed to keep an eye on. He couldn't even name what he was doing. He was just going busy here and there. 
It's so dangerous when we confuse motion with progress or busyness with productivity. It was the challenge that I had to prayer. I'm going to, I'm 59 and it'll turn 60 this year, but it happened to me at 19, 40 years ago, 40 years ago at 19 years old. It was my first year in Detroit. I got so tired, every day we'd be out on the streets evangelizing, every day, five hours a day for an entire summer, Monday through Friday, Monday through Friday we'd go out from 12 to 5, we would, we would hand out, this is going to be a new word for some younger generation folks, we would hand out this thing called tracks. How many remember what a track is? Not train tracks. These little booklets, they're, they're, they're gospel booklets. We'd hand out tracts, five hours. So 25 hours a week. And I'm telling you, it was, it was a month, almost two months, and nobody got saved. If you were on my team, zero. We had no success whatsoever. But I was busy doing all this other stuff. I was busy doing these things, that thing. And I'll never forget with a, where, where, where I became so dissatisfied, I said, God, I'm doing everything else, but probably the thing that I need to do, I'm not doing. And I made a commitment at 19 years old. I said, God, I'm going to get up. I've never done this before. There was, there was even no ramp up to this. I said, God, I'm going to get up every morning. At that time, it was 7 a.m. And I'm going to go to prayer. And I'm going to pray for one hour for you to come move on the streets of this city. I need for the Holy Spirit. To, I was so upset with failure. I was so upset that, that, that I felt no power. When you, when you lose prayer, you lose power. When you lose prayer, you lose praise. And when you lose prayer, you lose wisdom. And so I was, and none of those things were there. There was no praise awaiting God coming back going like people are saved. or There was none of that that was there. And I'll never forget, I started to get up at 7 a.m. in the morning. And folks, I can tell you, my, my, that prayer time it may, I may have given a few hallelujahs for the first three minutes and I sat there for 57 minutes going, I'm here. And I sat there for 57 minutes every single morning. And I'm telling you, as I sat there, God, was, God wasn't upset with me. He wasn't going like, he wasn't going like, well, say something. I was, I was sitting there and I'm telling you, and every morning I came, it seemed like heaven started to crack open and God started to do something inside of my heart that I'm so grateful at 19. And I remember that following week when the breakthrough started to come and God started to move and people started to get sick. It was as if God was going, you who answer prayer, just ask, just ask. Just ask for people to be saved. Ask for families to be saved. Ask for a spouse to be changed. You that are watching from Denmark, those that are watching from Kenya, those that are watching from Puerto Rico or from Italy, just ask. Ask God. Don't leave anything unoffered. Just say, God, you are the one who answers prayer. Praise is awaiting you. Praise is waiting in this house on, on tippy toes, waiting for the God who answers prayer to show up in my household, to show up in my sick body, to show up in my prodigal child, to show up in my demonic supervisor at that job, to show up and do something I can't do. Because when I clasp my hands together, it's a declaration of war and says, I'm not going to allow disorder to be in my home, my marriage, my life, my mind, but I'm clasping my hands today, believing for an uprising from God. It was the great Christian psychologist, Dr. James Dobson, who said this, he said, if Satan can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. And he says, and that's just about the same thing. Folks, look at that. God, get your phones out. Don't, don't look at me. Get your phones out and tweet that. Because this, this is, this is what, that's what's important. This is where the man messed up. He got so busy that he missed the prayer life, he, that, that he missed the, the, to, wa the, to become, uh, the, to, to watch this prisoner. I, I got so busy in ministry that I didn't even pray when I was in. But I'm so grateful that God got a hold of me at a young age. Because our goal is not to be busy, but to redeem the time. That's what God has called us to do. 
Listen, we, we unclutter our life by redeeming the time. We, we become experts or we become best at what we're supposed to be best at when we can redeem the time. Listen to Ephesians 5, 16. Redeeming the time, why? Because the days are evil. Or the New American Standard says it like this, making the most of your time because the days are evil. You know, when I think of that, the King James, and it says redeeming the time, I, I kept thinking, how do I redeem the time? How do I become not an expert in the things that really don't matter? Look, think of this for a moment. Why would Paul, why would the Apostle Paul use redeem, the word that we associate with the cross and the death of Jesus? Why would he take, why would he take such an important and the best I could say, this is, I wouldn't call it a fragile word, but he would, why would he take such, such a monumental word like redeem? We say redeem by the blood of the lamb. But why would he associate it with time? Because the apostle Paul was looking at what we do with these few years that God has given to us. So valuable that he goes, don't waste this, redeem it. It's, it's, it's a price to it. It's a price that you have to pay because that's what the word redemption means. It's someone who pays the price to, 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 to bring someone out of slavery. Re redeem, redemption is costly, it's valuable. And so I wanna just, just give them to you rapid fire about redeeming time in prayer and finding that we don't become experts in stuff that really doesn't matter. I want to be, an, if, if I want to be, if I want to be succeed in anything, folks, I'm just telling you from my heart, I want to succeed in prayer. Why? Because you who answer prayer, that's, that's why I want to pray. That's why I'm doing it. That's my, that's my charge. When I read that, I said, he is a deliverer. He is a provider. He is a God that is a savior, but you answer prayer. So here's what I've learned. Jot these three things down. I'll do them fast. And that, when I say fast, that doesn't mean anything either. So let's do this too. Here it comes. I, I will do this fast. I don't have, there's, there's, yeah, I can do it fast. Number one, make God first, not part of your day. Make him first. See, the God, the God thing doesn't work one day a week. That's religion. When, when, folks, that's why the Bible refers to our relationship with Jesus like a marriage. We are the bride. He is the groom. Folks, do you know what kind of relationship Cindy and I would have if I only talked to her on Sundays? <laughs> See, yeah. There'd be more construction cones, <laughs> doctors and surgeons even around me at that point. That, you can't have a relation. You can't have a relationship talking to God only on Sundays. That's a religion. Religion says, just give me two hours a week. Relationship says, we talk every single day. And we begin to communicate. I was talking on my phone uh, the other day. We were, we were um, Cindy and I were out of town for a couple days. And I, and, and I was watching my phone because we were in at an event for one of our kids and I'm watching my phone turn red, the, the battery, it's that dreaded moment when it's turning red and you're going, I'm not gonna have much more time on this and the battery was getting low and in a few moments, the phone cut out and you have to find a charger to get it up and to, to get it, to get it back, back working. But what was amazing was I charged it the day before but for some reason it didn't get charged at night. And what I was trying to do was I was trying to live on a charge from the day before. And the phone, as much as you talk, it doesn't work with the charge from a day before. I got to plug it in every single night to refill that phone so I can begin to have communication and do what I'm supposed to do. It can't do what it did yesterday on a charge from two days ago. Every single day, that phone needs to be juiced up. And for some of you, you plug in on Sunday and expect that to work for six other days. Let me tell you something. I, some of you are going like, where was he going with this? And now you're going, ouch. Okay, let me just say, because some of you plug in on Sunday. God, I love you, God. You're the God of Mary and the God of Abraham and the God of David with stones. Let me just tell you something right now. Listen to me close. That better not be the only time you're calling on the God of Abraham. You better call on him on Monday because that charge on Sunday, 
I'm going to tell you, you need a new charge on Monday. And you better charge up on Tuesday. you got to get up in the morning and say, God, I've got to connect to heaven. I've got to hear what God is saying to me. Thank God what he did here. But I need something fresh. I need something new. I've got, folks, listen, we give more attention to our Apple phone than we do for the Psalm 65 to God that says, God, you who answer prayer. Hallelujah. Let's plug in every single, it's the only time, listen, it's the only time when the disciples saw Jesus who would plug in every single morning, it's the only time that the disciples asked for curriculum and a study course after seeing what prayer accomplishes for Jesus. They said, God, it's the only time they said these words that it happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, when he finished, after he plugged up, one of the disciples very wisely said, Lord, tell me the rest of the words. Teach us to pray. Very smart. You know what he was saying to them? Teach us how to do this each day. We need, we need a fresh touch every single, folks, I have to do that every single morning. I have to plug up and go, God, I, I was having, there was, I hit a season that, that I was having individuals going, can, can we meet before I go to work? Can we meet before? So can you meet me at this time in the morning, at this time in the morning, this time? And I just tell people, no, I can't. And they always go, why? I go, I have an appointment. And then I had this one guy ask me three times. He goes, can we meet then this morning? I said, ah, same, I got an appointment. And then he asked me a third time. I go, he, goes, he goes, who are you meeting with every single morning? I said, him who answers prayer. That's who I'm meeting with. I said, that's, I said you wouldn't want to meet with me unless I met with him. I said, you got it all wrong. You think you need to meet with me. You need to talk to him. Make God first, not part. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip. What time is it? Oh, no, I'm not skipping anything. Okay, so let me just say this. It's 1140. We got time. Just give me 10, give me 10 minutes. Give me 10 minutes. Okay. I, I struggled with whether putting this on here or not, but I, I'm going to tell you, but it helped me. It's, this will be, this, number two will be short, and number three will be shorter. That means nothing. <laughs> it's number, the, I, I really struggled. I was going to pull this out, and I said, Lord, no, this has helped me. And, and, I, and I, I wrote this. I wrote, see the end of things, not the beginning of things. But let me explain what that means for a moment, because I take this from, from the book of Ecclesiastes. So many people rush into things because in the beginning it's shiny and everybody else is doing it. But God wants you to see things five and 10 years down the road and say, does it really matter 10 years from today that I'm really good at being the commissioner of fantasy football? Does it really matter that I'm, I'm, I'm an expert at pickleball? Some of you go like, why, why pickleball? because I don't play it. So let me just say, so it's easy to, so, but what I'm saying is none of those things are bad or evil, but don't become experts and leave off what really matters. You have to, don't, don't, don't go ahead and jump into, the, let me explain what I mean by this. Solomon, the richest man that ever lived on the planet, had no accountability he had every resource available to him, and this is his famous word that he uses at the end. Everything is vanity. That's an important word, because that, he doesn't say everything, he doesn't say it's dumb or it's useless, he says vanity. Now folks, the word vanity is huge. The Hebrew language is picturesque, and I have to show you what that word actually means, what, what was in the mind. The theological word book of the Old Testament says it like this. It says, in the Hebrew language, the word vanity was a word picture of a bucket that was put into a well, and when you brought it up, nothing was in it. It's this, you go through all this work, and you bring everything, and when it's finally up, nothing's there. Folks, 
That's what Solomon was saying. He said, I did everything you can imagine and every bucket was empty. Folks, look at me for a second. Before you go on a journey and putting that, you better make sure something's in that bucket. If you're gonna go through the work, then you better make sure when it comes up, there's water in there. And I'm telling you, every time you get up in the morning and cry out to God, I'm telling you, a bucket comes up, you will be full of all that God has and all that God, it is worth the work every, that every moment, every morning you pray, that's a good bucket, folks. It's a good bucket. Folks, when you come into the, you know, Pastor Patrick and I were talking about this. I want to I just say this to you. When you come to service here, uh, Tuesdays we have the pre-service prayer. But when you come on, on Sundays, you don't want to tell you what a good bucket is? When you get here early, man, start praying here at this altar. Start praying. Start getting down here. And, and just go. So, so you have to go like, okay, is it better for me just to sit there and check my phone and start texting? Hey, what's up? Where are you? I'm up trying to I'm come here. not at church. Why don't you just get up and start praying? How about, how about with every Sunday that all of a sudden you go, I'm not sitting there texting and I'm not sitting there just staring. I'm going to come down and pray that before, before that curtain goes up, we're going to go and say, this is a good bucket. Let's put that bucket down and let's come up. How many would be for that to say, we're going to begin and say, that's a good bucket for us. <laughs> Final thing, musicians come. This is real. I, I told you it's short. Okay. Third thing. When you pray, you're inviting God into every single area of your life. You're inviting God into every... Now, I have to explain this. This is really, really important to me. You know, it was the... Um, this is what Paul says. Redeem the time because days are evil. Redeem the time. It's, 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 it's making... Every day count, every hour count, every moment count. And when God is involved, I'm telling you, there's power, there's praise, there's wisdom. It's all there that God gives. Um, a name that's, that, that has gotten lost in church history is, is, I would tell every young person, his books, his biography, he hasn't written books, but his biographies of faith have challenged me to no end. He founded an or orphanage in Bristol, England. His name was George Mueller. George Mueller was considered one of the great men of faith. Um, in his autobiography, he said this. He said, and this is what challenged me about redeeming the time. He said, if I have five hours in a day to work, he said, I will accomplish more if I pray one and work four than if I work all five. Ooh, you're just sitting there. Let me, let me, let me try this. Let me see if I can, because you, you, they look mean on that side. So let me just say this. Mueller said that if I have five hours, let's reset this. Let's see if we can get this. This looks a little friendlier. If I have five hours in a day, I will accomplish more if I pray one and work for than if I work all five hours. I'll give you one more chance. I'm gonna give you one more chance. I will accomplish more. <laughs> Let me explain. Okay, you're back on the team. You're back on the team. Let me explain. Let me explain how important this is. It has to be, Mark, one of the, I'm trying to think of the word. It has to be one of the most mysterious verses of the New Testament in the life of Jesus that I've ever seen about redeeming the time. Of what, when you invite Jesus into your life, he redeems the time. He makes up time. Years that the canker worm is eaten. He'll restore the years. He'll restore the years. It's in John chapter six. Let me read to you what happens. And this is where you gotta cry out to the God who answers prayer. You who answer prayer. Listen to this. John six sixteen. And when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. You already know. Whenever Jesus sends you on a boat ride, you know a storm's coming. Like I've, at some point, if I'm the disciples, I'm going, I'm not going on that boat. Because <laughs> every boat ride we go on, it's always a storm. With, and, and, and for some reason, either you're sleeping or not there. 
It's exactly what happens. Watch this. And after getting into the boat, they started to cross the sea to Capernaum. And it had already become dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea began to be stirred up because of a strong, a strong wind was blowing. And then they had rowed about three or four miles, and they saw Jesus walking on the water, drawing near to the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, it's I, do not be afraid. Now watch this, folks. Here it comes. So they were willing to receive him. Here it comes, Mark. Watch this. Look at that verse. So they were willing to receive him into the boat. <laughs> Look. Okay. Do you see what happens? They bring him in the boat and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. I'm going, okay, let me, let me try this side. You had a chance. You, you did good. They were, they were, they're in a boat and they're rowing and they can't get it right. Jesus, when you come in to my journey, will you come into my life? Would you come in to my day? Would you come into my situation? And God goes, you've been rowing this thing for days, years, weeks, months. And God goes, you didn't invite me in. Let me come in. I'll redeem the time for you and get you to where you need to be. I just got to be brought into the boat. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, stand with me, hallelujah. You who answer prayer, hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's, in, that's incredible. If they didn't invite him in, they'd still be rowing. Oh, I wish we can get this right. I wish we can do. Get Jesus in the boat. Get him in your life. Get him in your day. Well, I'm a professor at NYU. Get him in NYU. Get him at Fordham. Get him at Columbia. Get God on that. Get him at Manhattan College. Get him in your university that you're watching from around the United States. Get him in Harvard. Get him in Yale. Get God in that. And say, God, I can't do this. But you know what we do? We just keep rowing. Invite him in. So this is what you do. You go, God, I'm going to invite you in. I'm gonna ask you to come in, Lord, and help me. You know what he does? He redeems the time. All the hard work that Kareem and the choir and everybody, God goes, invite me in, let me redeem the time. Let me redeem this. You go and I studied, I've done this, I've practiced, I've done all these things. They, they used to get angry at Mother Teresa and her missionaries of charity in India because they were working with people that were dying right there in Calcutta. And they said every day, when they're right in the midst of, of working with dying people, they would just leave for two hours, I think the time was. I can't remember the exact. They would just be gone. And all the visitors were going, like, why, why, why? There's, there's so much need, there's so much need. And this is what, this is what they said. They said, we've learned that to work without prayer is to achieve only what is humanly possible. We don't go to eat, we don't go to rest, we go to prayer so we can come back and do what only God can do in these situations. That's what happened. That's what we do. You know what they were saying? If we don't go pray, we are rowing the entire time. But if we go get God, bam, immediately on dry ground. Immediately immediately on dry ground. That's incredible. When you look at that verse, invite him in. Folks, listen to me. Online in the balcony, you're listening from the annex. You couldn't get into the main sanctuary. Let me just say this. Invite him in. Let him change you. Some of you are 40, 50, 60 years old and you're still rowing. I'm going to get this right. Life's going to get my, my kids are going to love me. My grandkids, his grandkids. Thank God for grandkids. And there you go. You think, it's, you think that's going to be the answer because I messed up with my kids, but am I messing up with my kids? And you're going to still row. How, how, do I, how do I fix this, Pastor Tim? You get God in your life. Invite him in. 
invite him in and God goes I can redeem the time I can redeem the time I can redeem the time that you're not making him part you're making him first you go no more empty buckets I'm not going to do in more any in empty buckets and God I believe you're gonna right now I'm believing that you are going to begin to step into my life that boat is your life so here's I'm just gonna ask you this some of you have been rowing and rowing and rowing and today it stops we invite him in today we invite him into our lives today and maybe you've never done that before as we close maybe you've never done that before it, it, it let's mark are you playing that that abraham mary david song okay great is it abraham is in that song he's not even he's not even in the song well he should be Who is the first guy in the song? Jacob, that's it, Jacob. Yo, no, Jacob needs to be in that song. He's, Jacob was a train wreck. Um, J- Jacob needed to invite God into his life. Um, thank God he did. Which, which really is a miracle because for, to, for God to associate his name with Abraham, Isaac and to associate his name with Jacob, that's crazy. But you who answer prayer, if there is a prayer you can pray right now that can change, it's the the invitation prayer to say, God, come into my life. Change me from the inside out. The Bible calls it being born again. You know what born again is? You get another chance. You get another chance. But this time, your life, your boat, you're not alone this time. You've got the God of Jacob the God of David. And as great as those names are, can I tell you what my favorite name for God is? You who answers prayer. That's my favorite name for God. Let him answer, let him answer a born again prayer today. Let him answer the prayer that says, come into my life and change me. What does born again mean? Just as you had a first birth, Jesus says you need a second birth. He says no man can see the kingdom of heaven unless they are born again. John 3.3. 3. That's what Jesus said. You, can, you, can, you can't get to heaven unless you have that second birth. You were born the first time in a hospital or maybe by a midwife or in a home, wherever. But that second birth has to be spiritually and that, I, I, that has to happen right now. You may be a student. Some of me invited you today. You may be watching online because someone shared a link with you. It may be Tuesday, Wednesday. It's not even a Sunday while you're watching this in Barbados. You're watching this in, in, in um, South Africa, Kenya, Ukraine, Russia. That you're watching this in Italy, France. But now we invite them in. We say, God, come and change me. And if that's you today, no one's... Nobody's going to bow their heads. No one's going to, this isn't even private. This is you making a decision going, I'm tired of rowing in my life. I want God to come in and change me. If that's you, and just say, Pastor Tim, I want him to come in. I want to invite him into my life. I want God to come in and change me. That's the second chance. That's being born again. It's, it's as simple as ABC. I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe that God sent his son to become my my sin bearer and see confessing him as Lord that we talk every single day not just on Sundays today that can happen to you I want to pray a born again prayer that gets you on this journey if you're here today and say Pastor Tim I need him in my boat I need him in my life no hesitation if that's you balcony main floor Pastor Tim when you pray that prayer would you put me in that prayer I want to start a journey with hold your hand up as high as you can hold it up as high as you can keep them up over there 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 Keep them up over there, there, there. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Balcony, balcony, see you, see you, see you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey, you know what I'm going to ask you to do? I know, you're, I know your hands are up. I'm going to ask you to take a second step. Would you come and meet me right here? Come on, get out, of your, get out of the seat right now. And if you should have raised your hand, come on down. Come on, come on. Over there, over there. Balcony, we'll wait for you. We'll wait for you. This is important. This is important. God's going to do it. Come on, get out of your seat. God's going to do it. God's going to get... God. God I'm so happy that you guys are here. I'm so happy that you're here today. I'm so happy. Every single one of you. Come on, quickly. Get out of your seat. Don't, don't, don't wait for anybody. Just go, I got to get this right. I want him in my boat today. I want him in my boat today. I want him to change me from the inside out. 
and that's why God's going to do it. And if you should have raised your hand and you didn't, come on down, because God's going to do it for you today. God's going to do it for you today. God has you. We'll wait for your balcony. We'll wait for your balcony. We'll wait for God just to come and do this. I'm so happy you're here today. I'm so thankful that you're here today. What a blessing. Come on down. Is this a whole family? Is this mom and daughter? Is this? Come on. <laughs> I love it. 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 Hallelujah. 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 This is the beginning. It's the beginning. When you get him, you're going to stop rowing now. You stop rowing and you go, God, come in and change me. We've got some balcony folks coming in. We got you guys. We'll wait for you. Come on, balcony. You're coming down. Awesome. Awesome. Now, as these amazing people are coming, this is a brand new start for their lives. Brand new start. Let's begin. Come on. You guys, come on down. I'm so happy you guys are here. Made the, you're making the greatest thing. No more rowing. No more rowing for you guys. No more rowing. This is the beginning of a brand new. Hey, can we all pray this together? Come on, let's all pray this together. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. I believe that on the cross, you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, and you died for it. You faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to go. You rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. Okay, now say this loud. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. The Bible is my guide. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen and amen. Come on. Do we thank God for what he has done here?